thank you for being with us today. I'm Gina Downs with the Maya Committee. We've got Dave Ensler today to speak on exercise for health and well-being. Dave Ensler has been the Director of Recreation, Fitness, and Wellness at USI since 2001. He is also an instructor in the Department of Kinesiology and Sport. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland, where he received his BS in Kinesiology and his Master's in Biomechanics. He has coached swimming and or cross country at the collegiate and high school levels for over 40 years. He and his wife, Frances, currently coach the swimming and diving team at Memorial. Prior to coming to USI, he was the fitness center director and an instructor in physical education at the University of Evansville for 16 years. Please welcome Dave. Thank you. Uh, kind of embarrassing hearing all that. I wrote that stuff, but whatever. But, uh, um, this is not the first time I've been asked to speak at, at, at a session like this. Um, I recall the very first time was I was probably in my late 20s. And I was asked to speak to a group of uh, what they called senior citizens at the time about exercise and aging. Um, and this was going to be a little bit different uh, for two reasons. Back then, I was coaching uh, at the college level for cross country and swimming. And I was working with a bunch of college age students. And so I was basically telling them, this is what you have to do. Okay, I'm the boss. You do it. Is this, this the way to get fit? This is the way to run faster or swim faster or whatever? And so the differences here will be this. When I spoke in my mid-20s to a group fresh out of graduate school, even though I was teaching exercise physiology, <coughs> there may have been a little bit of a credibility gap, okay? Because I knew a whole lot about this. I didn't know a damn thing about this. <laughs> I had no experience whatsoever. And all my knowledge about aging was from books, what I've read, what people have told me. Um, I can now tell you 30 plus years later, and having exercised all those 30 years pretty, pretty uh, religiously or vigorously, I know a lot more about this <laughs> than, than I ever thought I would know, okay? So maybe when I share things now, it might have a little more, a little more credibility, so to speak. And two, again, back then, I was used to telling people, this is what you have to do. I'm not going to tell you today what you have to do or what, even what you should be doing. I'm going to talk about some suggestions of what you might want to do. The, the uh, American College of Sports Medicine, which is kind of our, uh, the body that gives us most of our information, gives us some recommendations, uh, what, you sh what you should do, and I'll post those and talk about it. But if you're like me, um, you're tired of people telling you what you have to do. You, I've had enough, okay? You know, I have a daughter who's a nurse, another daughter who's a physical therapist, and they're pretty good about not telling me too much, but every once in a while i got to tell them back off. You know, I don't want to hear it. About eight years ago, my wife was asked to teach a course in, uh, in health at University of Evansville, and I noticed one day I came home and I couldn't find anything good to eat in the house. Okay? I mean, everything was low fat, high in fiber, low in sugar, low in taste. I mean, you know, and I, Francis, I don't need, I, I don't want that. I mean, I might need it, but I'm tired of people telling me what to, what to do all the time. So today, I'd like to just come to some suggestions as to what you might want to do and let people decide for themselves what's right. Okay, so I'm not going to be telling you, you know, you have to do this or have to do that. Uh, I think I know what we should be doing, but I also realize that because of the aging part, I understand that some of us have just had enough of telling us what we need to do. So, with that being said... If I get this to work here, I can't get it to work, looks like. I'm in trouble. There we go. What are some of the effects of, you know, aging exercise? And we'll go through this fairly quickly, but what are the normal changes as we age? You know, you probably, probably can add to this list yourself if you want to. But the things that I, you know, talk about, this is not working the way I want it. Here we go. Okay. Body composition. We know that as we get older, our body composition changes. As we get older, uh, our muscle mass decreases and our fat increases. And what that means basically is that even if you stay the exact same weight that you were when you were in high school or in college, you've probably gotten fatter. Okay, you probably lost some lean tissue. We have this wonderful measure that everybody uses, you know, BMI, body mass index, which is no nothing more than a glorified height weight chart, that's all it is. It doesn't tell you what you're made of. And, and so we know that, that no matter, not no matter what, but generally speaking, as we get older, 
there's a change in our body composition, one of the main components of, of fitness. Another is muscular efficiency. Uh, we lose strength, we lose power, we lose endurance as we get older. Um, I can recall when I was working uh, at a club and we were kind of building tennis courts for a whole summer, and I was carrying 80-pound uh, bags of concrete, and I would put you know one on each shoulder, carry it down. And by the end of the summer, I was carrying two on each shoulder. At one point to show off, I put three on each shoulder. I just one time, just to show off one time, okay? All right, fast forward to about a year and a half ago, I'm building something in my backyard, and I go to the, to the Home Depot, and I reach down for one 80-pound bag, and I, I, can I get some help here, you know? I, I, you know? So even though I've stayed fit, my strength has definitely decreased. It, 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 again, it doesn't have to happen, but it tends to happen. Cardiovascular function tends to decrease, and that's your heart rate. Um, for any given exercise, tends to go up. Stroke volume, that's the amount of blood you pump for each time, it goes down. Therefore, cardiac output, the amount of, of blood you can put out at any time goes down. The ability to consume oxygen goes down. Circulation is decreased usually. Respiratory function decreases. Um, as generally, what happens is we get more winded at a lower intensity and we can't go as long. And that's pretty general as you get older. Flexibility, your range of motion decreases probably in all the joints, and that could be because of muscle um, changes or even joint changes, maybe something uh, in, in both cases if possible. And your bone density decreases. You've heard that before, I'm sure. And generally your hearing goes, your eyesight goes, you get shorter, and, <laughs> and, and the list goes on, you lose hair. and you know, you know, I, I might just put, put a blank here, fill in the blanks, you know. Put in your own things, okay, so... <laughs> Not a very pretty picture, I agree. But then what are the benefits of exercise? And there's a theme to this, obviously. Is that as you exercise, generally speaking, your muscle mass increases and fat decreases. In other words, the exact opposite of, of the aging uh, phenomena, or age, what we consider to be normal for aging. If you exercise the right way, you have an increase in strength, increase in power, increase in endurance. Now, you may never get back to where you were when you were in your 20s, but you can certainly get better than you are now if you haven't been exercising. So, that's encouraging news. A cardiovascular function um, definitely improves. Stroke volume goes up. Uh, your heart rate at any given workload will go down. Our ability to consume oxygen goes up. Circulation is improved. Uh, respiratory function improves. All these things that we associate with aging going down get better when we exercise. I'm not telling you things you don't know. It's just kind of a, you know, a refresher. Uh, flexibility, you know, it may increase. Depends on what you do. Doing the wrong exercises may not help at all, but the right exercise, you definitely can increase your flexibility. Uh, no question about it, if you're doing weight-bearing exercises, bone density increases, that's really, really critical. Uh, can't help you with the hear eyesight and the hearing and the height and so forth, okay? Uh, sorry about that, so, but, uh, but anyway, you know, I got a picture of my son, uh, I, I should have put it in there, we, we did the, the Big Ten 10K a couple weeks ago, and, um, you know, I, I, I got to stop standing next to him because it makes me look shorter and shorter and shorter, so, but anyway, so. Um, so I guess the question here is, are these things that we talked about in the left-hand column, are they true aging phenomena or are they because we've just stopped exercising? Is it chicken and the egg type thing? In other words, do all these things have to happen to us? And the answer is eventually yes. They have to happen so early. So when I speak to a group of college students, I talk about the fact, let's try and delay this as much as possible. There's no reason for us to hit your peak at 20 and then go downhill. You can keep that peak up for a long, long time. Um, I know you're going you're to hear from Diana Knight and I had tomorrow, but I can tell a story about someone that, that I knew when he was in his 20s, early 20s. He was a, a national champion in the 100-meter freestyle. At 48, he was swimming faster than he was as a national champion in, in his 20s. Now, the rest of the world had gotten faster faster than he did. But still, he was still that good 28 years later. He hadn't dropped anything at all. Now, yes, his comment was eventually he started to go down. So the question here is, you know, when does it have to happen? So we know that exercise can delay some of the aging effects. And what we're concerned about, it, it can reverse some of the effects that, that, you, that may have set, set in. So if you have somebody that, you know, or yourself that has been sedentary, um, there's no doubt that with the right exercise program, we can gain something back. We can improve something, whether, and, and how much is the question? Strength, endurance, cardiovascular fitness, flexibility, body composition can all improve 
no matter what age you're at. Will you ever reach what you were when you were 20? Probably not. But do you need to be that, that fit? Probably not. Okay. Um, eventually, though, we all age. I should have put that in smaller print, you know, but uh, so that, anyway, but that, it's going to happen. So I tell the story that uh, I used to do it uh, when I was in college. I did a, a two mile run for a PE class, and I did it in 12 minutes, and I was pretty proud of that. And I did it, it happened to be on my birthday that the test was given. And every year on my birthday, I'd go out and run two miles to see if I could do it. And for the next 25 years, so I was 45 years old, I was able to do two miles in, in 12 minutes. Can't do it anymore. Okay. But I was pretty proud of the fact. And at some point, no matter how much I trained, it just kept on getting slower and slower and slower. So, and now my son's beating me and pissing me off. So, 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 so. Anyway. So the question is, why should you exercise? Okay, what is your motivation? Okay. I think it's an important factor because um, when you talk, well, first of all, what's your motivation for exercise? These are the questions that a personal trainer should ask. If you're working with somebody, what is your, what is your goal? Okay. What are some of the types of fitness? Well, number one might be health fitness. And that's what concerns <coughs> most of us as we get to be my age. You want to live longer and you want to live better. And that's maybe your motivation for exercise. That's why someone comes to you and says, comes to you or yourself and you say, I need exercise because I would like to live a healthier lifestyle. I'd like to do more things, whether it be with my grandchildren or whatever it happens to be, or I just want to live longer. And so people are interested in health. There's a good news story and really even a better news story. And here's the good news. If you're only interested in health as your exercise goal, and if we were to put people in three categories, low fitness, moderate fitness and high fitness. If you improve from low fitness to moderate fitness, there is a dramatic health improvement. There's no question about the health improvement that can take place by just going from a low fitness level to a moderate fitness level. If you go from moderate to high fitness, there isn't a whole lot of additional health benefits. I mean, there's some, but there's diminishing returns. So the good news about that is it doesn't take a whole lot to go from low to moderate. It takes a lot to go from moderate to high. You gotta be somewhat of a, of a fanatic. I'm kind of a fanatic. I work out an awful lot. I know that most of what I'm doing is not for health reasons, it's for some other vanity, whatever the reason might be. But all I know is the good news is that for most people, if we can just get them out of the low fitness level into, the, I don't wanna call it average, but the moderate fitness level, there are dramatic health improvements. Reductions in heart disease, reductions in cancer, reductions in diabetes, reductions in some cases, reductions in, in, the, in the effects of arthritis, and the list goes on and on and on. So the good news is it doesn't take a tremendous amount of work to get the health benefits. It might take a lot of work to go to the next level if that's your goal, and some people have that goal. Their goal is performance. They want to compete. They want to go out there and run 10Ks, or they want to play tennis or basketball at a high level, a competitive level. And in that case, they probably have different goals. And therefore, you treat them differently, or they have to have different exercises. And then there's people who exercise only for appearance. I want to look good. Okay? Um, I would say when I look at, at, at the people that come to the fitness center here at USI, most of them around 18 to 20, that's number one goal. The guys want to get bigger, and the girls want to get slimmer. No, so, so, okay, so. And, and that's generally, that, that, that's not, not a rule for all of them, but that's generally the rule, generally the rule. Most of them aren't saying, I'm here so I can live longer. They're 20 years old, they're going to live forever, okay? All right. But, and, and the key is that you can have multiple goals. For example, I can recall many times when I was really interested in performance and trying to compete, and the side benefit is I was healthier and I looked better. But my main goal was definitely this. That's what I wanted to do. I definitely want, so that's a, a question you have to ask yourself or have to ask somebody, what do you want to get out of this? Why are you doing this? And the health reason might be that my doctor says I have to, my spouse says I have to, my grandchildren, someone's telling you have to. That may be the case. But why, why, what is your goal? And now what are some of the side benefits, maybe even additional goals to exercise? One is possibly the emotional uh, benefit, stress relief. Exercise has been known to be a great, great way to relieve stress. Now, I have to tell you, not all exercise does this, okay? Some exercise can be stress-inducing. So I tell this story. About 20 years ago, I was running a league for the faculty at another university. 
um, across town. I won't mention any names. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and we had a faculty you know, member who came out and played uh, three times a week. It was at noon. And one day I got a call from his administrative assistant slash secretary back then. She says, you know, when my boss comes back from playing, he's really, really in a bad mood. He's a bear. He snaps at the students. He snaps at me. He snaps at his colleagues. He goes, can you help me? I said, no, he's terrible. He sucks. He can't play. He's, he's, he's terrible. He's terrible. He's like, he shouldn't be playing basketball to relieve stress. He, you know, he fouls everybody. He gets in arguments. That's not a stress reducer. He needs to find something better that's not going to cause him so much stress. And so if competition is your main goal and you also want to have stress relief, then my advice to you is pick your opponents very carefully so you can always win. But otherwise, <laughs> it, it, may, it may not be all that stress relief. It may be some kind of intellectual. You know, there are people who say, and this is important because I'll ask a question later on, is that they like the challenge of figuring out what they have to do. They like the challenge of, of the diet. They like to think through the process. It can, it can be an additional benefit. Not everybody likes that. Some people like to be told what to do. Okay? It may be social. This is your social time. You, one of the added benefits you have is that when you go out and exercise, you're with your friends. And I know this is, a, this is an important part for me. I tend to... Uh, uh, to run in the morning with my wife, wife three times a week, and I ride with my friends in the afternoon most of the times, and it is what we call conversational pace. If we're running so fast we can't talk to each other, then we need to slow down. It's supposed to be a, supposed to be a conversational social activity. Okay? I will point out that when I first started running with my wife, the benefit I had there was that I was in much better shape than she was, so if the, if the discussion got to something I didn't want to talk about, I'd pick up the pace, and either she, either she would drop off, or she wouldn't give it a talk, you know. Well, she's gotten better, gotten slower, and, I, and now it's like I, I lost that advantage. So, but, but so. Maybe. Yeah, I know. But, uh, it's not good. So. And then the question is, is it fun? I mean, I mean, you know, some people say exercise is drudgery. It can be fun. I know a couple that does uh, ballroom dancing twice a week. And they do it because it's fun. The side effect for them is it's healthy. It's exercise. But the real reason I do this is for the fun part, the social part. So these could be the main reasons why someone does it. You know? And I have to admit that many times I get up in the morning, I usually run or something early, and if someone wasn't waiting for me so I could go out there and do it, I'd go back to bed. So having the social aspect is, is important to me. Okay. Some other questions that you need to answer. Now, I talk to our students all the time, I, uh, people who are personal trainers, that those, those goal-setting Setting questions are very important. Why are you exercising? But maybe more important are these next questions when establishing a routine for somebody. Okay? Why are you exercising? Are you social? I've had people come to me and say, I spend all day long talking to people. My hour of exercise, I want to put on headphones and tune the world out. That's an important question to ask before you plan an exercise program. I've had other people who say, I spend all day long looking at a computer screen. I want to be with people, human beings, and so forth. So you put them in a different exercise routine. So the question, these questions here are, are all designed to establishing a program that they will stick with. That you can could, you could say they're fun or less you know, painful or tolerable, whatever. But the idea is to make this something they'll do. And this may be as important as pointing out whether, whether, whether they're doing bench press or whether they're doing squats, it would be more important to say, do you like doing it by yourself? Do you like doing it in a group? Do you like doing it with a partner? That may determine whether they stick with it or not. And that's probably the question that our students don't ask. They want to put everybody in the same thing. So, um, Are you competitive? Do you like to compete? Is that important to you? It's a question you need to ask. Because they may decide what, what program you put them in. Okay? Uh, how much time do you have? Probably more important is, how much time will you devote to exercise? I see so many trainers who say, okay, you need to come three times a week for an hour and a half. And the person agreed, yeah, I'll do that first, but then they realize that's too much. Find out how much time they are willing to devote to exercise. If they say 20 minutes, then give them a 20-minute program. And if they like it, they might increase later on. But the worst thing you do is give them too much early, and then you drive them away. So that's a really important question to ask somebody. Are you a morning person? What time are you going to, you, say, you suggest they get up in the morning and join a group. Or do it after work. Like, whatever they like, ask that question. When would you like to work out? What's best for you? That's probably, again, more important in my, my viewpoint than what they're doing. 
is finding out what they will do. And then and work, work on that, okay? Um, do you need a push to get started? Do, do we need to get you a personal trainer? So if you're paying so many bucks a, uh, a session, you're likely to show up and do it. Or, or, or are you self-motivated? Okay. Do you need some intellectual stimulation? Here the question is, do you want to set up your own program? Or do you want to go ahead and have a personal trainer that tells you what to do all the time? Are you willing to do things, you know, make up your own program a little bit? Those are all questions that might lead to someone sticking, sticking to it or not. So the question I ask my students every year, and I stole this from somebody else a long time ago, what is the best exercise? What is the best exercise in the world? And it's very simply, it's the one that you will do. It's the one that you, they will do, and you have to find out what they will stick with. And I think uh, some of our personal trainers I've talked to these students, they don't get it because they're so used to working with this very narrow age group of 20-year-olds. And we keep on telling them, you have to find out what they like, what they, what, they, what, they, what they dislike the least or most, whatever, find out what they'll do. And that, that's often ignored, okay? Some general principles I want to talk about here of exercise, okay? Individuality. We're all individual. We're all different. We have what we call high responders and low responders. <laughs> you have a couple come to see you. The, the, the wife goes on a diet, and the husband says, oh, I'll go along with you just for the heck of it. And then the wife gets mad because she's lost two pounds, he's lost 12. Okay, he's, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a high responder. Every one of us responds to exercise and diet differently. And so the key is don't get discouraged or don't get, you know, bent out of shape because someone else is doing better th than you are. And that's a big problem, especially with our younger students in the weight room. He's benching something, i got to bench this as much. And, and you should bench what you can bench. Okay. Um, specificity. So it basically says that any adaptations or improvements that you get will be specific to the type of activity that you do. In other words, if you, don't, if you don't do stretching activities, you're not going to improve your flexibility. If you want to improve a certain thing, you must target that particular thing, whether it be strength, whether it be flexibility, whether it be cardiovascular endurance, whether it be anything. You have to work specifically towards whatever it is you want to improve. Okay, reversibility. Use it or lose it. All right? If you don't work something, it's going to deteriorate. It's going to age. So you have to... Now, the good news is it doesn't take a whole lot to keep it. It may be difficult to improve something, but maintaining fitness is not that difficult. It may be harder to get there, but once you've got it, it doesn't take a lot. But if you don't do anything at all, and anybody who's ever been in a cast knows, you don't use it, you lose it. The overload principle, this is a really important principle for us to understand and possibly, in one way, ignore, okay? You must increase the demands on your body to make further improvements. Now, the good news here is if you're doing nothing, that's really easy. <laughs> that's really easy. If I'm not stretching at all and I stretch a little bit, it'll improve, okay? Mm -hmm. If I'm not lifting at all, it's a little bit, it'll improve. If I'm not lifting at all and I start lifting a can of chunky soup every day it's ten times, that'll, that'll be an improvement. The point is, if you, if you just do more than you're used to, there'll be improvement. But the key I want to talk about is that maybe you don't need to improve. There are certain people who, especially young, young kids, who say, I've got to get better and better and better. And when it comes to competition, that's true. When it comes to health, again, once you reach that moderate fitness level, going higher gives you minimal return. So you don't have to keep on going longer or harder or farther. If I go out in the morning and I run my, you know, my four miles in, in, in 37, 38 minutes, whatever it happens to be, that's good enough. I don't need to go 36 and 35 and 34 and 33. I don't need to get any faster. That's plenty. So the overload means if you want to improve, but you don't have to overload. It doesn't have to be this challenge where you're always trying to get better and better and better. Variation. I think it's pretty important if you want to keep things fresh. And this is the... the, the, the Example I give was a guy I knew who was in his 80s. He lived on a lake, and what he told me he did, this is up in Wisconsin, he said during the summer, the middle of the summer, he would swim across the lake and back. It wasn't a very big lake, you know, but it would take him, you know, maybe 15 minutes to swim across and back. During the fall and the spring, he would canoe around the lake. And then during the winter, he would ice skate on the lake. He went through periods, and that kept him fresh. So the key is you're changing things up, you know, whether it be by week or by month or by whatever, or by season. But, you know, we all get a little tired of doing the same thing over and over again. 
So, how do we prescribe exercise? And this is what I'm talking about. I, I'll give some suggestions, but it's up to you to, to, to decide. You talk about the intensity of the exercise, the duration of the exercise, and the, free, the, and the frequency. Those are the three things. And they're all interchangeable. Okay? Or they interdependent is probably a better word. So, that um, you can exercise at a very high intensity, a short amount of time, or you can slow down the intensity and go for longer, and both give you similar results. Okay? Uh, I guess an example I can give here is that if you jump rope for 10 minutes, which is pretty high intense exercise, okay, three times a week, you'll get a lot of cardiovascular benefit out of that. Okay? A, lot of, a lot of fitness improvements. If you walk briskly uh, four times a week for 40 minutes, you'll get about the same benefit. So one has a much lower intensity and um, longer duration, and one has real high intensity and shorter duration, and they're about even as far as cardiovascular improvement. So you can make those adjustments. If someone's got plenty of time, you can slow them down, go a little bit longer. The, the advantage of that is it's definitely safer. It's easier on the joints, easy, less chance of injury, a lot of positive things about that. Um, if someone's really pressed for time, they're going to give you a short amount of time, then you may have to jack up the intensity a little bit. Again with doctor's permission and safety and everything else. But you can get the same benefits you, in different ways. I had a coach that I, I worked with back in the um, 70s. In the 1950s, he was the Olympic coach for, um, for the U.S. And he said one year, he had his entire team swim nothing but short, intense, hard swims. That was his training. Okay. He went to the nationals. They won nationals by a landslide. Four years later, he did the exact opposite. Everyone swam distance. And it's, in, in training, this is like night and day. This is like, you know, two incredibly different approaches. Everyone swam distance, no sprints at all, went to nationals, won by a landslide. There's lots of ways to attack this. Okay, whatever works for you and your schedule. Okay. Generally speaking, lower duration, I mean, longer duration and lower intensity is better for weight control. Burns more calories. If your goal is to lose weight, slow down, go longer. Okay. Then really high intensity. High intensity doesn't, we can't go long enough to burn as many calories as we could. Okay. Doesn't need to be continuous. Doesn't need to be 60 minutes straight, 30 minutes straight. It could be five, six minute sessions during the day. It could be, you know, I, I know that my, my mother in law, who's in her 90s now, lives in Willow Park, and what she does is she gets up in the morning and she says to walk her hallway twice is about a third of a mile. Before breakfast, she walks the hallway twice. Before lunch, walks the hallway twice. Before dinner, walks the hallway twice. That's great. Rather than walking the whole thing six times at one time, you can, you can break it up. Doesn't need to be continuous. Okay. Now these are the recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine. Okay, cardiovascular recommendations, and again, I don't want to read them all, but they are uh, can be a little bit, you know, intimidating. 150 minutes uh, of moderate to intense exercise per week of cardiovascular. That's the recommendation. 21 and a half minutes a day, average. Okay, of moderate to intense. Now for some people, that's nothing. For other people, that's 21 and a half minutes of torture. Okay, they're, they're not going to enjoy that. So you got So that, that that's what the recommendation is. Okay. You can do it through a, a variety of ways. You know, 60 minutes of moderate intensity, 20 minutes of high intensity, whatever vigorous. Same thing we were saying before. You can you can play with the numbers to make it fit your schedule. For weight training, resistance recommendations. Adults should train each major muscle group, in other words, several upper body exercises, several lower body exercises, some in the front, some in the back. So try and work on both sides of the body, both ends of the body, so to speak. Okay. Three days, uh, two or three days a week using a variety of exercise and equipment. Okay. And the recommendation they give is um, very light or low, light intensity is best for older persons or people who are previously sedentary, especially when you're starting, you want to injure somebody, start off low, okay, very light. And we'll, come, we'll have some examples before we're done today. So, And the general rule is to pick about 10 exercises and do 8 to 12 reps. So that by the time you get to the 12th one, you're tired, not exhausted, but tired. So if, you, again, you grab that can of chunky soup or chunky <coughs> if you want, and you do 12 exercises, by 12th one, you're tired, that, that's good. And if, you, you know, if, it, if it's not enough, get a little bit heavier. The idea is to find something that you do, about eight to 10 exercises, some upper body, some lower body, and try and do about eight to 12 reps. Now, in, in, 
in the fitness world with, with the students, we say, you go to exhaustion. And they exhaust yourself between 8 and 12. And when you can do 12, increase the weight so you can do 8 again and work your way up. That's overload. They're trying to get better. If our goal is to maintain, you should feel some fatigue at the end of the 12th rep. And that's great. And that's going to maintain what you have or improve what you don't have. Okay? You don't need to overload. You don't need to make this painful. Okay? And again, as you get older, they say, um, go more reps and less weight tends to be recommended. Okay. But hey, if you want to do 8 to 12, more power to you. I mean, there's no reason that we have to stick to a stick with that and say, well, you're old now, everything has to change. Okay? And adults should wait at least 48 hours between resistance uh, training sessions. Oh, this, this notion that you're tearing the muscles down and then you're building them back up again. I'm not sure that you're tearing anything down or not, but your, butt, your muscles will um, recover and be ready for the next workout if you wait about 48 hours. Okay. Again, I know when we coach swimming, we, aren't waiting for, we are not waiting 48 hours. We are working them every day, twice a day, and we are beating the heck out of them. You know? And that's but that, but again, they're, they're, they're 20 you know, or, or less. So, but, uh, flexibility. You should do flexibility at least two or three times a week to improve your range of motion. And again, you can go online and find a whole list of exercises to do. It's not difficult, but each stretch should be held for about 10 to 30 seconds, and there should be some slight discomfort or slight tightness. If you're going to the point where you're having a lot of pain, you've gone too far. You've gone so slight discomfort. Again, this is the overload principle. You're subjecting the muscles to a greater stretch than they're used to, holding it for 10 seconds or so, then relaxing or holding for longer if you want to, and that will improve your range of motion. Um, repeat each stretch, so forth. Okay, then there are different types of doing it. Static stretching is where you take the stretch and you hold it. Dynamic is where you're kind of bouncing or ballistic, where you're kind of you're stretching back and forth real fast. And there's some, there are some uh, risks with that, especially as you get older. We recommend more static exercise if you can. P and F is a base, basically. Um, a combination of contraction followed by relaxation in a stretch position that uh, usually can be very effective. We don't need to be that technical, I don't think. Okay. And we know that flexible exercises are most effective when the muscle is warm. So it's best if you were to you know, start out by walking a little bit, getting your body warmed up, getting your body heated up first, and then stretching. Your muscles will stretch. So uh, I know that athletes, especially swimmers, and I've coached swimming for a long time, they do not want to get in the water, especially in the morning. I mean, it's like, it's, it's worse than pulling teeth, you know. It's like, I want to get the bull whip out sometime. But, and they want to stretch. And I say, well, if you want to stretch, you swim for 500 yards first, and then you stretch. And that has no appeal to them whatsoever. You know, they, 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 want to, they want to stretch and not get in the water. So, especially when, well, we get guys and girls together, they want to stretch and flirt and everything else. So, but that's another story. <laughs> another story. So, but, uh, something that's relatively new, and, 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 since I made a presentation many, many years ago, and because I've been teaching it for a long time, was this is neuromuscular exercise or functional fitness training. The idea is that you want things that are, that, that promote balance, uh, agility, coordination, in other words, things that have to do with some kind of motor skills, okay? Things that, um, um, again, sports, a lot of sports have this built into it. So things that we can do that help hand-eye hand -eye coordination, or balance or agility. I mean, you know as we get, people get older, we hear of stories of them falling, losing their balance. And I got to tell you, uh, I'm 61 years old now, and I, you will not see me on a, on a staircase without holding one to a railing. I mean, one every, one every 100 steps, my foot just doesn't want to cooperate, okay? Or one out of 1,000. When that 1,000 times come, I'm going to be holding on, okay? I mean, it just tends to happen. We tend to lose our balance a little bit. And so this helps to improve something that's relatively new, okay? Now, 20 minutes a day of appropriate neuromotor exercise, and you add all that together, and you're saying, my God, I don't have time to eat or sleep or do anything else. You know, it, gets to, it gets to be daunting. It gets to be way too much. I, I can't do all this. And so you do nothing. This is too much. We've all been there before. You know, okay, you know. I mean, if you can't do all things they say, you to the point where you say, why bother? You know, I recall someone one time told me that uh, they had a lot of these claims they had that for every minute you exercise, you live a minute longer. Uh, that, 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 we don't like, that's probably not true. But that, 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 they were promoting that when I was in college. So if you exercise, and of all you exercise for, from the time you're 20 or 60, and you've exercised for eight years, you live eight years longer. 
eight years of agony by exercising. That shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It should be something that's better than that. So I think the key here is, well, how do we take all this and put it in a, in a working form for people? Okay. What are some suggestions for cardiovascular exercise? A whole list of them here. You know, uh, walking, swimming, jogging, or do all the uh, walking or running or jogging on a treadmill. Um, dancing is a great exercise. Uh, stair climbing, whether it be actually climbing stairs or on a machine of some sort, jumping rope, if you like that kind of stuff. Um, uh, ride, horseback riding, cycling or stationary cycling, rowing. Aqua aerobics or aquatic exercises are great because they're non-weight bearing. Um, it's cool in there. I mean, people, I know that, that as you get older, people love that. The only problem is since it's not weight bearing, it doesn't do a whole lot for bone density. But it is a great exercise if you've got joint issues, or, someone, or someone, someone's very heavy, getting them in the water supports that weight. Uh, the problem is they're very heavy, they're not, not usually anxious to get into a swimsuit and get in public sometimes, so the environment may be really important, okay? Um, aerobic dance or step, and really, and all kinds of sports and games, and that's what I think we, we tend to forget. Just because you're 60, that doesn't mean you don't enjoy playing. And we should play. We should spend more time playing. Tomorrow there's going to be an exhibition on pickleball. How many of you guys are familiar with pickleball? Okay. It's really a fun game. It's kind of a combination. It's kind of like you've taken a game of tennis and shrunk it down to a short little court, and the ball doesn't bounce quite as much, and, and it's a little bit slower pace, but they get a great workout there, and they'll play. So tomorrow, if you get a chance, I think it's at 12.30, there's an exhibition over in the rec uh, for pickleball. Go watch it. Go watch it. And there's pickleball leagues all over the place, and uh, you see them outdoors and indoors, and uh, as one example, okay? Um, resistance exercises. Anytime you're using your own body weight, okay, is a resistance exercise. So what could you do? Okay, for example, they recommend do push-ups. Okay, I can't do a push-up. They might say, I can't die. Push-up? Are you crazy? I can't do that anymore. Well, maybe, maybe what I can do is, I can't do a push-up. Maybe I can do a push-up against the wall. You can't just do this. Very little. And, and that's more than they can do. That's great. As they get better, you can get them lean a little bit farther. As they get better, you can have them go to a staircase and put their, their hands on the fourth step and do a push-up and move their way down the staircase if you want to. Or you can stop at the fourth step. Who cares? Okay, the point is, lifting your own body weight may be a great way for someone to overload. It doesn't cost anything. Do it anywhere. Okay. Doing squats. Taking a chair, and, and if you want to, take a tall stool and just squat down on it and stand up. No weights, nothing. You get a little better, you go to a little bit, little bit lower stool. Okay? The joints hold up, no pain, great. Go a little bit deeper. Go a little bit deeper. Go to the point where, you're, where your butt's hitting the seat. Doing that's great exercise. Okay? You can use your own body weight. Okay? All kinds of things you can do. When you work on your calves, it can be as simple as on both feet, just rising up and down on your toes. When you get better, you go up on one foot. I get my, my better. I can't do it. So, but, uh, so, <laughs> all right? so you can use your own body weight. If you have a place that has weight machines of some sort, the advantage to the weight machines is that they're very safe, they're very easy, they're very quick. I got to tell you, if you can't tell by looking at me, I don't like to do weights. Okay. I mean, these, these guns are, you know, there's, there's not, there, I don't like, I, I love to ride a bike. I love to go out and run. I, I'm a cardiovascular junkie, but I hate, that, that isn't even a strong enough word. I more than hate doing weights, okay? I know they're good for me. So I go over to the rec, it's an advantage, it's in my building, my office, I can see it the whole time while I'm there, and I will go to the first exercise and I will grab a weight on there and I will do machine and I will do 12 reps and move on and I can do nine exercises in nine minutes. I'm just moving down the road. Now I'm not getting any better. But I'm getting, keeping my bone density up. I'm not, not getting any weaker. And that's all it takes. Now, I hate it. But for nine minutes, I can put up with it. What I hate even more than that is stretching. Okay? <laughs> so, okay so. But I do a little bit of that, too. Okay? So the, my point here is that if you find the machine, it's real simple. Just, just pull the pin out, put it in where you want it to, do your 12 reps or 10 reps, move on to the next one. Doesn't need to be painful, doesn't need to be terrible. If you have access to it, it's great. Okay. Now, a lot of your athletes will say, well, we need free weights, barbells and dumbbells, because they promote balance and they promote you know, strength. Even on, and that's great for the athletes. 
If you're in competition, you might want to use free weights. But if you're interested in health and wellness, I'd say stick to the machines. Fast, easy, safe, if you have access to it. If not, buy a set of dumbbells, okay? I'm not talking about your spouses or children. I'm not talking about your dumbbells. And, and, and grab some, you know, two and a half or, or four or, eight or five pound weights and do some curls and do some lifts this way and just do some things you want to. And again, just do eight to rep. <coughs> Bless you. Doesn't need to be this tremendously complicated routine. Just more than they've been doing if they want to improve or what they've been doing if they want to maintain. Okay? And then one of the new, and again, the kind of newer things is resistance bands. These big rubber bands that have handles on them, you know, and you can, you can they, they're still convenient. You put them around some kind of door handle and you can do pulls and you can do pushes and you can do lifts and you can do squats and you can do all kinds of things. And, it's, and do it in your home. Um, I've got some people who come to me and say uh, they can't work out on the road because they're, 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 they're traveling all the time. Grab two resistance bands, one light and one heavy, put it in your hotel room and go to work. And that's great. Very convenient. Do it anytime you want to. Okay. Stretching. You know, uh, yoga and Tai Chi are great classes, and I gotta tell you, I ain't going near either one of them. So, but, uh, <laughs> I went to a yoga class for a semester, and I know it's good for me, but I, again, hate that I not enough work. I just really just agony, you know. And then all these young kids stretching all over the place. I'm going, what? How are you doing that? Who was meant to move that way? I, I can't stand it. Okay? But they're great. If you like that kind of stuff, it's great. I mean, it's wonderful flexibility. It's wonderful circulation. There is some strength building there. There's certainly, uh, in, in yoga and tai chi, some balance and some stability. They're all, I mean, I'm not, I'm not knocking it. It's just not for me. If you told me that I had to do yoga three times a week and that was my exercise routine, I'd say I'm ready to die. Okay, I'm ready to go. I'm ready. I just can't stand it. So if someone tells me you have to do yoga, that's that's not a good prescription. So make the prescription something they could do. If they tell me go ride a bike, go out for a walk, go run, go swim, I'm all for it. So take advantage of what I like, and convince me that by stretching a little bit, I'll be better at the things I like. And that's the the, the approach that I take. Okay. Oh, there are some exercises. We, we won't uh, go through these right now, but some suggestions are just standing up and sitting down is a great exercise for some people. Um, shoulder shrugs to release the, the, in fact, you want to join me real quick, go ahead, to release the neck and shoulders a little bit. You know, you can really do that while you're watching television if you want to, okay? Uh, loosen your hands with circles. Improves the circulation, okay? So there's good flexibility, good for circulation, okay? Just pointing your fingers. All the way out and back again, pointing them all back. You know, it, well, well, you, can, you, can, some, you can feel the tension kind of leaving because we never do this. Now, be careful you do it. You might get a little strange sometimes, but, uh, but uh, you know. Um, do a torso twist. Just kind of turn to one side and turn to the other. Just feel those muscles that you don't normally use being, being taxed, being challenged a little bit. Okay. Uh, stretch your back with a big hug. Hug yourself. Hey, hug somebody else. I don't care about you being in the camp. But hug you, then hug yourself. Okay? Uh, cross your arms like this in the front. If you want to raise them up, raise them down. Feel the tension, you know, upper back and shoulders leaving. Okay. You know, if you haven't done these things, if you haven't done these things, it is an overload. That is an overload. That will show improvements. Now, I see these, these, these young ladies there in the, in the back about second and end row, and they're thinking, this ain't, I'm talking about you right there, you know, you know what, what are you, 14? <laughs> right there, yeah, are you, are you 13 years old, how old are you, 14? Yeah, pretty close. Okay, so what I'm getting at is that, you know, you're thinking, these aren't worth a darn, you know, these are simple things. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, I'm talking to you there a little bit, but, uh, you know, maybe, the, for, if I suggest these to, to my class at, at, at the university, they'd say, what are we doing? This is a waste of time. But I know for me, just doing those few things makes a difference. Okay, so whatever tends to work. Okay, um, look up. Sometimes just the day when that can release the tension in your neck and so forth. Those are all things that just suggest. And you, and you can find these online anywhere with examples and uh, you know, nothing special. Now, the neuromotor, anything that promotes balance. Okay, riding a bicycle. Okay, if you can't ride a bicycle, 
then I wouldn't recommend trying it. <laughs> it's learning the hard way, you know, to get a bicycle. But if you can, get on a bike and ride it. It's great for balance. It teaches you balance, okay? Um, anything that has to do with eye-hand coordination. You know, playing catch, okay? Playing ping pong, playing tennis, playing badminton. Anything where you have to coordinate movements of your hand with what your eye sees is what they're talking about, neuromuscular exercise. Okay? The idea is to teach your motor system how to, or, or reteach it, how to function. You know, I can recall when my kids, when my, when my son was younger, we were outside shooting baskets every single night. You know, playing horse, playing one-on-one, -on -one, until he got big enough to come with the one-on-one games, got a little, <laughs> Well, they got a little too intense. I wasn't, I wasn't ready to lose yet, and he, he wanted to win. So, but, so, but we just, just playing, you know, horse out there, shooting, catching the ball. That, that does wonders for keeping the, the neuromuscular functions. Okay, uh, anything having to do with agility, where you're changing directions. Okay, anything has to do with gait, walking, running, still promotes balance. Okay, so you don't have to have a separate exercise for balance and also for. Uh, for, in combinations. Do some exercises work more than one fitness level? Many games and sports might improve a lot of these things. Playing a sport like tennis, playing a sport like um, it, 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 you know, volleyball. And now you might say, well, volleyball is a little too, little too intense for me. I've seen a, a group of students, some, uh, older students, play volleyball with a ball. It's a bigger ball, had to bounce in between. Up and had to bounce, and they're moving around. Anybody can hit it. They're moving. They're working on eye-hand coordination. They're working on balance. They're working on coordination, they're working on cardiovascular system, they're doing everything. And they're having a ball. They're having a blast. Okay. A lot of sports, if you can do them, have this. Okay. So what's your excuse? What are the excuses we're hearing? Why aren't we doing this? What do you hear when you ask people, you know, I don't think there's anybody out there that doesn't know they should be exercising. Everyone knows, I mean, I, I make the same example. We tend to think that if we tell people what that they need to do, that they will just immediately do it. If that's the case, with warnings all over the place, on every cigarette cart and everything else, everyone knows you shouldn't smoke. But some people still do. It isn't enough just to tell them what they should be doing. What's their excuse? Why aren't they doing it? Any suggestions out there? What's the excuse for you? I'm not saying for you, but, but, but for your spouse, whatever, you know, that you want to do with it. Not, not enough time. Okay, we'll cover that one too a little bit. What else? I'm too tired. I'm too tired to do exercise. Okay, interesting excuse. I think that's probably a common one. What else? What? It costs money or equipment or a gym membership, whatever. We can, we'll cover that one too. Anything else? hurts. It hurts. If it hurts, you're probably doing it wrong. If it hurts, you're probably doing it too much too fast. I have to admit, no matter what you do for the first time, you'll probably have some residual or some what they call soreness the next day, delayed muscle, delayed onset of muscle soreness. But if you're really, really sore, you've done too much, you've done the wrong thing. It shouldn't be to the point where you can't walk the next day. Or you can't comb your hair the next day because your arm's too sore. And I've been there. I've been there before where I played a sport and one day and I couldn't do I couldn't do anything. You know, Francis, can you come comb my hair for me, please? I mean, you know, so I mean, I, I've been there before. I know what it, I did too much. That's wrong. Okay, so we had so we had some excuses we had were no time. I don't have time for this. I'm way too busy. Okay, it's boring. Or I'm too tired. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. You hear that a lot. I'd like to start, but I have no idea what to do. I hear that a lot, especially, especially with some of the younger students that come in. And I get some of the faculty that come in too. Okay. I don't have any equipment. Too much money. I'm not going to join a health club. Too much money. I can't do it. Okay. Well, what's, what's our solution? What's the answer to any of these things? I mean, any one of them. Anyone want to take a shot at one? Self-talk. Pardon? Self-talk, I guess. Okay, well... Let, let's make it, let's, let's address their excuse. Let's address their <laughs> excuse about no time. Okay. I know that I do like to watch television. And there are a few shows I really like to watch. I, I love NCIS. <laughs> Almost as much as I like 
Um, Big Bang Theory. <laughs> okay. I just like that. Like she's cute. So with that, so with that, so with that. Um, combine it with something else. Can you combine it with... Can you, for example, can you walk on a treadmill while you're watching your favorite television show? Not run, just walk on the treadmill. Okay. Can you ride a stationary bicycle while you're watching your favorite television show? Okay. Um, listen to your favorite show while walking. Okay. Um, I have, um, again, the, the aging story here is I've got my back seized up when I was, uh, I was actually in Austria about two weeks ago, and while running, I'm running, and there's this beautiful mountain in front of me, just gorgeous, and I'm running to these villages, and there's, you know, these beautifully maintained homes, I mean, it's just like, it's, I'm in Salzburg, I'm, 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 the hills were alive, you know, <laughs> you, know so, so. you don't get that one, do you, 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 you don't get that one, she's still young, she's still young, so, I'm sorry, so. And I'm running, and my back just seizes up. And to the point where, you know, I can barely catch a breath. So I, since I've been walking, walking's boring. Walking just takes too much time. So I bring along my two favorite morning buddies, Bob and Tom. This is Bob and Tom in the morning. And I have a good time listening to Bob and Tom. You know Bob and Tom, don't you? Okay, yes, okay. I listen to Bob and Tom, while I, while, and, while, and I'm combining something that I like to do to make that hour of walking in the morning much more tolerable. So you combine it with something else. Um, walk or bike to do errands. You know, whether it be a quick trip to the grocery store and we're not getting much. Obviously, you don't want to carry back a bunch, a bunch of groceries. <laughs> walking, you know, walking to the post office. Walk in any place that you can walk to. You know, I know when I was a kid, we didn't have uh, mail that came to our, our front door. I mean, came to it, but you had to go ahead and put your mail in a mailbox down the block. Walking a block, drop the mail off is one of the things that we, we could have done. But find ways to run some errands. You know, uh, this idea of uh, you, know, you know of parking as far as you, as away as you can at, the, at, the, at Walmart. I don't want to haul a bunch of groceries back the full length. I, I can appreciate that, but find a way to to incorporate exercise in your normal lifestyle. Okay, things like you know I mean, taking the stairs versus you know the elevators. Uh, there's some options there, but you know. How about making it social or family time? Um, my wife and I told you when I'm healthy, uh, we run three times a week in the morning. Like I told you, now the conversation is much more even than it used to be. It used to be pretty one-sided. I could control it, not anymore. She's gotten too fast for me. But I, I contend that we have more meaningful discussions in that 40 minutes of our walking to warm up and 35 minutes of running and finishing than we have any other time of the day. At meals, it's not the same conversation. We have, I, have, I have a more interaction with my wife when we're running than any other time of the day. Uh, as sick as that may sound, I think it happens that way sometimes. Okay. I can recall having a discussion with my daughter one time. This is happening. She was an uh, eighth or eighth grader, so she was going to high school, and we were playing ping pong, and there was no eye contact. So I said to her, you know, some of your classmates are going to drink when they get to high school. Are you going to drink? And she goes, no, Dad, I'm not going to drink. And, okay, yeah, but, and, uh, <laughs> and I, said, I, said, I said, well, why not? She said, because I'll get in trouble. And, I, and without any eye contact, this, this made the conversation really easy. We're watching the ball rather than each other. I said, you know, that's not a good enough reason because you'll find out that you probably can drink a couple times and not get in trouble. The other risks that, you know, you make bad decisions when you drink, whether it be getting in a car with somebody you shouldn't, going home with somebody you shouldn't, all these, all these things we talked about. But I recall that, and that was 20 years ago, of one of these most meaningful discussions we had, I thought, while doing something that was exercise. I think combining with family or a social, t a social, a social group is a great way. Okay, some quick precautions here, okay? As we get older, we definitely be more careful about exercising in the heat. We do not handle the heat nearly as well as you get older. So plan your exercise when it's not in hot. Go indoors, go earlier, go later, staying out of the sun. Really important that we are conscious of as we get older that we do not subject ourselves to heat exhaustion. When you get to be my age and older, you are much more susceptible. So whether you're prescribing exercise or doing it yourself, 
really be careful about exercising in the heat. Find another way to do it, another time to do it. If you have to do it in the middle of the day, then definitely lower the intensity. Definitely slow down. Okay. Same thing happens in the cold. Now, it's not very, they, they used to say that, you know, that you're breathing in this cold air, you're going to burn your lungs. That's nonsense. It's not going to happen. Okay. The air gets heated up so fast, your lungs are fine. But we know the two things that can happen is our extremities, as you get older, circulation to our extremities, our fingers and our toes definitely decreases. So you have to dress warmly or be careful of being out when it's really cold for, for frostbite. And then more importantly is that if you're out while the sun is shining, exercising, and you make it back after the sun has dropped and it's cold, real, real possibility of um, hypothermia. So you need to be real careful, especially as you get older. Okay, so keep that in mind. And uh, as you get older, and I experienced this, and I, was in, and I was in Austria this past week, walking up these hills with my son, I couldn't get my breath as much as he could. Altitude affects 10 people that get older a little bit more. Okay, so keeping those things in mind. Okay, so I finished up, and I'll have time for questions if you want, but to finish up again, what is the best exercise? What should we be doing? What should we be prescribing would be whatever they will do. Find out what you will do, Find out what your clients or your patients will do. And that's what we need to be working on. If they have a love of something, capitalize on it. They might say, I really love to ski. Then why do you live in Evansville? Okay. okay. But I really love to ski. You capitalize on that. Say, if you do these exercises, you will ski better. Let's work on a few balance things, a few strength things, so forth. I really love to do some sport, whatever happens to do it, but I can only do it one day a week. I love to play golf, for example, but I can only play on the weekends. Well, during the week, let's do things to make your golf game better. The key here is find out, there's no magic formula. There's a million ways to skin this cat. Find out which one's going to work for that person, going to work for you. And the other thing is we don't have to kill them to do it. If you're in good shape to begin with, it doesn't take much to maintain it. And if they need to improve, all you got to do for health is go from the low fitness level to the moderate, and you've had big health improvements. There's, there's no real health improvement from going from moderate to high fitness level. And there is a risk, much more risk of injury, much higher risk of burnout. So that'd be, that'd be my advice is that, you know, make it as fun as possible, or at least as tolerable as possible. And any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. So. Either I was terrible or really good, one or the other. So. And I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going with really good. Thank you.